Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. For just a moment ago, you could have heard me speak without a microphone and you would have enjoyed it more. Um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Today, the forum is opening up the door on a really, really important topic. We have a wonderful speaker and he'll be starting in just a moment. Uh, in case you have had your eyes and ears closed for the last, gosh, I don't know, 100 years, we have a Second Amendment, we have gun issues in this country, and today we have the opportunity to learn more from, the, from Jake Wiegler, who is with the Oregon Alliance for Gun Safety. And without further ado, we, we'll hear from him. And don't forget, questions, keep them in mind, and only paid up members of the forum can ask questions. Ladies and gentlemen, Jake Wiegler, thank you. Thank you, Rob. I really appreciate that. Uh, so um, again, my name is Jake Wagler. Uh, I am with the Oregon Alliance for Gun Safety. I'm a political consultant here in the Portland area. Work on a variety of projects, including uh, Ted Wheeler's re uh, campaign for mayor and doing a variety of issue advocacy on state and federal issues. And i uh, really excited to be here on behalf of the Alliance today to talk a little bit about the work that we do. So uh, oh, that's the wrong way. There we go. Um, so, uh, as Rob said, gu gun violence is not a new issue in our nation. Um, it's something that we've been dealing with since our founding. Obviously, the situation has evolved a little bit with the increasing sophistication of our weaponry. Uh, our founding fathers obviously didn't anticipate assault rifles and armor-piercing bullets and things like that. But uh, it is an ongoing conversation that we've had as a nation about what is the appropriate balance between individual liberties and uh, the right to have a safe community. And uh, just to take a little bit of a further detour down history, even before this present part of the presentation I put together, uh, I think it's really interesting to note that there have been a couple kind of major moments for stronger gun laws in our country uh, in the 20th century. And the first one actually happened uh, during the Great Depression. Um, so maybe some of you all uh, have heard of this. Uh, but you know, we had uh, this thing called prohibition. I know, usually I'm talking to a younger audience. I have to kind of help bring them back to the days of yore. Um, and so with the implementation of prohibition in the 20s, saw a dramatic increase in organized crime and related uh, gun and other types of violence that came out of those organized crimes that we all saw uh, you know, in the movies uh, from Prohibition. And so you had people with automatic weapons, increasing use of silencers, things like hand grenades that obviously the public was fairly concerned about. And so the first uh, gun laws that were passed were actually the 1934 uh, National uh, Firearms Act, which did a number of things. Uh, it, first of all, banned the sale, actually that's not correct, it, it regulated the sale of machine guns. Uh, and initially at that time, uh, you had to file and register with the federal government if you wanted to own a machine gun. Uh, we've gotten increasingly restrictive about those regulations so that now you can even not even buy a machine gun, you can just apply to have a machine gun that's already someone's already owned in their private collection, but there aren't obviously new machine guns for sale. Uh, also regulated the, the use of silencers, um, grenades, some other kind of fairly dramatic weapons, sawed off shotguns, that's where the law came from. Um, so that was kind of the first wave of, of stronger gun regulation that came as a response to the violence that people were seeing uh, in the community. And then of course the next major wave came in the late 60s. Um, as we know it was a time of great uh, social conflict. Uh, there was a lot of very highly visible um, assassination attempts and, and assassinations of our public leaders. There was also just a general high level of violence. Um, I'm sure you all remember the riots that occurred after uh, the death of Martin Luther King and just a general heightened state of kind of um, uh, visibility of gun violence in our community during that time. And so that's when, uh, in the late 60s, the Congress passed additional regulations to create the background check system that we have today and some other types of things to uh, regulate the sale of weapons. Um, we are, we, I believe at least, uh, in kind of a new stage of awareness around gun violence uh, that started a few years ago 
um, one with a shooting that occurred here locally at the Clackamas Town Center shooting, and then of course at the Newtown, uh, at the Sandy Hook Elementary in uh, Newtown, Connecticut. And these, along with some other shootings like the uh, shooting of Gabby Giffords and a number of her staff members in, uh, in Arizona the year before that, as just as well as general increased attention around public uh, gun violence has really kind of created a new groundswell of desire among the public for action. And so uh, I'm here to tell you a little bit today about how that has transpired in Oregon and kind of where we are today uh, th through the Oregon Alliance for Gun Safety and where we think we might be going. So um, as you can see in this poll, if you look closely and you can read the, all the different numbers, um, you'll see that there, the focus on gun violence and kind of balancing this general question of should we make our laws around guns more strict um, has kind of shifted. And so that you'll see there was a period where uh, in 1990 there was strong support. Some of y'all remember we passed the crime bill during that period, the assault weapons ban, the Brady bill also were passed in the early 90s. And then we had a trend that went basically, uh, well, except for a few blips, uh, downward so that more and more people were shifting to the view of, no, we don't need stronger gun laws, we just need to keep the laws as they are now. And then if you look, there's a very important uh, bump that you'll see there between 2012, 2014, which is after those shootings I just mentioned, where you had a kind of renewed sense among the public that this is an area of crisis, we need to take some action uh, to better protect the public health. And um, just to give a little uh, context before I jump into those specifics here um, about gun violence in Oregon um, is that we have an interesting juxtaposition in our, in our country and that what we see in terms of gun violence tends to be a couple things. Uh, one is we see the truly dramatic shootings, the Clackamas Town Centers, the Umqua Community Center, the shootings that occur at schools. Uh, these are highly visible. There's a lot of media attention to them, and they really touch us, I think, in very personal ways, because you know, particularly with the issues at schools, they remind us that this violence can occur anywhere, and that it's not like it only occurs in certain neighborhoods or to certain populations, but that any of us could be caught in a crossfire or be uh, subject to a, a random shooting. And so that really seems to have galvanized kind of public opinion that we need to do more. But the truth is, um, the typical gun violence that we see in Oregon and across the country is not these dramatic shootings. Um, on average, about one person every day dies in Oregon from gun violence, uh, and about three quarters of those are actually suicides, so people who choose to take their own life with a firearm. Uh, a lot of the other shootings that are publicized or that we see a gun deaths are actually related to gun crime that tends to happen uh, more in urban areas, uh, in particularly in communities of color. And uh, you know, I think those also get framed in terms of more of crime and gang issues and less in terms of the issue of gun violence. So we have this interesting tension kind of in that the reality on the ground is a lot of the gun violence is not getting the attention uh, that it might get otherwise. But we have these symbolic shootings that really kind of have focused people's attention even if that's not the day-to-day -day experience of how gun violence is occurring. So uh, coming out of those tragic shootings, there was a very large conversation about what can we do to reduce gun violence? Um, and I think this is an interesting question. It's touched people on a lot of different sides of this issue. Um, people who are opposed to stronger gun laws will say, you know, it's really not about the gun, it's about the person. Uh, and other people will say, um, you know, what's the one thing we can do to really stop gun violence? And uh, what our group has tried to do and to talk to folks about is that there isn't uh, one magic policy that's going to uh, address this problem. That it is like a lot of other public health challenges we have in our community, whether it is prescription drugs, or alcohol, or household cleansers that can be potentially poisonous. They're things that we believe you have a legal right to own in our society, but we also know that there's a public health impact to that ownership. And so the question is how do we put in place policies that allow people to exercise their rights protect the right of the individual to uh, own something they're legally entitled to, but also do that in a way that minimizes the danger to the public's health or to others around them. And so that's kind of the balancing act we've really tried to pursue and think we have some interesting ideas about that conversation. So first, obviously, is the background check system. Um, and just to give folks a little context, uh, right now, at the federal level, um, if you, uh, in terms of federal law, if you go to buy a gun 
from a gun dealer, a federally licensed gun dealer, one has to go through a background check that proves that you're not a criminal, that you haven't been adjudicated mentally ill and um, sent to an institution, that you don't have other kinds of convictions that are uh, put to you at risk, and, and a few other, you aren't a felon who's on the run, you know, all these good reasons why we probably don't want you to have a gun. Um, that only applies if you go at the federal level, that only applies to if you go to a federal gun dealer. So if you go to a gun show at the Expo Center, or if you go online on uh, armslist.com or Craigslist, um, you can buy a gun from someone, you know, go meet them in a parking lot somewhere, have them come to your house. You can transfer that gun with no questions asked, no background check required. So. That was a major focus for us as we were kind of starting to look at how we could address stronger gun laws in our state and our nation was let's strengthen our background check system. You know, we can agree that there are certain individuals that probably shouldn't have a gun because they're a danger to themselves or to others. And let's make sure that as guns are getting purchased that we're screening individuals to make sure that only users that we think um, should be able to own that gun can actually possess it. Not surprising, this is a very popular concept, as this sur uh, survey shows you. Um, these are three different polls that were taken from 2013 to 2015, and you'll see um, they all exceed 75% support for the idea that every time a gun is transferred or sold, that you should require a background check. And um, as someone who works in politics, I gotta tell you, we don't often see issues that 75% of the public agrees on. It's pretty rare. Um, and then, of course, it's ironic that despite that strong public support, this has been a very difficult issue to have a conversation with at the legislative level. But nevertheless, we jumped in. Um, so here in Oregon, uh, traditionally, there was one organization that did most of the work on gun violence. Ceasefire Oregon had been a longstanding organization. Um, after the shootings in 2012, we saw a number of new groups of individuals get involved in this, in this movement. Uh, one is called Moms Demand Action, uh, literally, one mom, Shannon Watts, stood up after clock, after excuse me, after Newtown, and said, "We've got to do something." And within a few months, had organizations that had sprouted up all across the country, of moms just saying there has to be an answer to this. Uh, same with the Brady campaign was another organization that had been involved historically, but had really kind of ramped down their activity here in Oregon, but um, kind of got reengaged after those really dramatic shootings. Um, we tried to push hard. Um, in the 2013 session to try and coming out of those tragedies to close that background check loophole. Um, as you can see from the slide, we were not successful. Um, what we learned was that we were not ready to have the conversation with legislators and that from their perspective, uh, this was a risky topic because they had been told anytime you wanna talk about gun policy or look at gun regulations, um, folks are gonna come and punish you at the ballot box. Um, because you're going to be seen as infringing on their rights. And so what we learned in the 2013 session was that we weren't ready to actually be able to move legislation. We tried hard. We had some good conversations, but the votes were simply not there. So we, got, we rolled up our sleeves. We got busy. Um, we started working with a couple national organizations. Uh, one's called Every Town for Gun Safety. Uh, that is an organization based out of New York. Um, has set up operations across the country to really um, be an effective advocacy vehicle for uh, gun, stronger gun legislation. Another is Americans for Responsible Solutions, uh, which is an organization co-founded by Gabby Giffords and Mark Kelly, um, her husband after that shooting, to really bring um, a little bit of a different perspective on gun violence. Um, they come from the American West, like us, so they come from a culture of owning guns. As you probably know, Mark Kelly is a military veteran. And so the idea was, we aren't anti-gun, that we recognize the Second Amendment, we recognize the right of people to own guns, to use them for self-protection, for sport, for a variety of uses, but we need, in that context, to have a conversation about what we can do to keep the public safe in the context of respecting those rights. So had some really productive work with them to try and get out in the community, start organizing, and came back into the 2015 session uh, with a, a three main uh, priorities that we're pushing for and felt pretty good about our results. The first one was that we expanded the background checks bill for all gun sales, um, and this was Senate Bill 941 in the 2015 session. So now in the state of Oregon, like only eight other states in the country, if you're going to sell or transfer a gun to someone, you need to go through the background check system. You need to go to a, a gun dealer and transfer the gun through them and make sure that, there's, that that person is actually legally allowed to own it. Um, fairly high public 
fight, but we're really happy with the result. The other important piece that we really tried to focus on was the issue of domestic violence, um, because you know there is a very clear intersection between gun violence and domestic violence. Um, I don't think the gun's the source of the problem, but it does tend to make the situation a whole lot worse when there's a gun involved. And so uh, what we looked at there is situations where um, one of the partners has decided, I, I want to get out of this relationship. This is an abusive, dangerous relationship for me. I'm going to go to court and try and get a restraining order, a protective order, and move to starting to create my own life. And the data shows this is actually the time that victims of domestic violence are most at risk uh, because they are, that is a situation where the abuser tends to take aggressive action. Obviously, that person is then cut off from their support situations because they're taken out of their home. Sometimes they have to leave without money and clothes and other things like that. So it's a very uh, dangerous situation. And so the bill that we worked on um, deals with giving the court the ability to remove a gun in that kind of situation so that up till then, um, there was not necessarily clear authority for uh, after a protective order had been issued for law enforcement to say, okay, um, you're obviously in a domestic conflict right now. Um, this is going to go through the courts and work out. But in the meantime, we'd like you not to have a firearm because we're very worried about what that could do in this situation. And so Senate Bill 525 allowed the victim of domestic violence to go to the court as part of their protective order and say, um, you know, my partner has a weapon. I, I fear for my safety. That's why I'm here for this protective order. And can you order that gun be removed until the situation is resolved? Not a permanent removal, uh, and certainly uh, d has due process in the courts so that that gun owner can go through and say, no, I have a great to own this gun, but that there is a process in place so that law enforcement can take a gun out of that situation during that high period of stress. Last piece was actually something we were working to stop. Um, and this deals with concealed handgun licenses. Um, if folks don't know, we actually have a pretty uh, large number of folks in the state of Oregon that can concealed carry. And just to give you a little context to that, um, it is illegal to be out in public with a weapon concealed unless you have a parent a, a permit to do so. And so you have to go to your state or your county sheriff and request a permit. It's not too onerous of a process. You have to go through a class fill out some paperwork, um, but then you have that right to carry. And that right to carry also gives you a lot of um, privileges that the regular citizen doesn't have. So for instance, um, if you have a concealed carry permit, you're allowed to take a gun into the capital of the state of Oregon. Whereas if you don't have that permit, you're not allowed. Same with uh, going and testifying at City Hall here. Uh, if you have that concealed carry permit, you can carry that. Another uh, other example of that is schools. Uh, right now, a school district can set a policy that we don't allow weapons on campus. Uh, that concealed handgun license actually supersedes that. And so an individual, if they have that license, is allowed to bring a gun regardless of school district policy. So um, that's the current law in Oregon. Um, you can think what you want about it. Um, but what we were concerned about was a proposal that would say, if you have a concealed handgun license permit in another state, we're automatically going to grant you the same privileges here. And our concern for that was that there were folks in other states who would not be able to get a permit here. Uh, so for instance, if they weren't 21 yet, um, if they had certain misdemeanor convictions that are restrictions here that aren't in other states, uh, et cetera, that that would allow someone from Utah or from Maine or Virginia who could get a concealed handgun license there to come to the Oregon and carry a weapon, whereas if they were here and an Oregon citizen, they would not. So work to stop that legislation. We're successful in defeating that um, just because we thought it would really not make our communities more safe. So that's where we are coming out of the 2015 session. I want to talk kind of a little bit about going forward and where we were hoping to take the conversation and also make sure I'm not running over on time. Oh, we're great. Um, so I think there's really kind of three important principles that we are focused on uh, with our work looking forward. Uh, one is the idea of keeping guns out of the hands of dangerous people. And by dangerous people, I mean people who can be a harm to themselves and others, people who have a conviction for a felony or a violent misdemeanor uh, or a domestic violence conviction. As I said, people who have been adjudicated by the court system to be dangerously mentally ill, uh, felons, people on the run, things like that, wanted criminals. Um, these are kind of the criteria that we want to see enforced so that we can keep guns out of the hands of those individuals and, and get some better clarity on there. Um, the second piece is encouraging responsible gun ownership because beyond saying we probably want to have certain individuals in our society that 
shouldn't have access to a weapon, recognize that the rest of us will. And then how do we behave in responsible ways uh, to minimize the threat to the public and to the larger community? And so um, this is, goes to the idea of encouraging responsible gun ownership. We think there's a number of different ideas that we could look at for this. One of the most obvious ones that I'll talk a little bit more in the future is making sure that if you have a gun in your home and you are, know there's a child that's gonna be in that home, that you make sure that kid doesn't get access to that weapon because Maybe your child's prepared to deal with it, but I know my four-year-old is not prepared to handle a firearm, and I don't want her to get any near, anywhere near one. Um, and the last thing I think is that we need to find a way to move beyond polarization. You know, this has been a very divisive issue. Um, there are a group of folks in our society that feel very strongly about the Second Amendment, um, have opinions that any infringement upon the Second Amendment should be treated with suspicion which makes sense. Anytime we're talking about our constitutional rights, we need to be careful about what we're giving up. Um, but that, it, that has also made it a lot harder for us to really have a thoughtful conversation about this issue and that it tends to get polarized into pro-gun, anti-gun, or city slickers who don't understand what it's like to own a gun versus you know rural people who don't want to have any sensible talk about preventing gun violence. And I think those stereotypes are really preventing us from dealing with this issue in a more effective way. And, um, you know, it's not directly analogous, but I'd say, you know, I think you can think a little bit of context about drunk driving and where that was in the 70s. And the attitude at that time, which was, people are going to drink, this is their right, this is America, you know, and that's just kind of the cost of doing business is, yes, there's going to be some drunk driving incidents, yes, there'll be some un unneeded fatalities, but that's just kind of how it is. And I think that we, appreciate now in our communities that there is a way to have responsible consumption. You see it on every liquor or TV ad you see for beer or liquor. Um, you know, this idea of not furnishing liquor to minors or to people who are already drunk and could get out on the road and cause harm. And so there is a way to kind of de-escalate the rhetoric, move beyond kind of the entrenched camps. And so how do we do that? And particularly, how do we do that outside of kind of our urban areas? Because we know this does have a clear kind of rural urban uh, division. And so how do we have a conversation with folks uh, in other parts of the state who may have gun ownership more as part of their daily life. If you live in a rural part of the state, I appreciate why you feel a need to have a weapon for personal security. Law enforcement is probably not going to be able to get to you if you're living way out an hour away from town or if you are working outdoors. You know, I don't want to pretend like I wouldn't be scared to death to see a cougar across my path. And if you are going to be out in the woods working, you know, I appreciate why you might feel a need to, to have a weapon to protect yourself. And so how can we have that conversation, recognize different perspectives, and come to some sort of sensible agreement about what we can do on this issue? Um, just to preview a little bit about the 2017 Oregon legislature, and that's part of the other part, uh, focus of the alliance that we're trying to do is have a more focused conversation about gun policies and do it in a more thoughtful way so that people don't feel like, oh, this came out of nowhere, all of a sudden the legislature's voting on this, I never heard about it. And so we're really trying to take some time over 2016 to get out to talk to folks like you, uh, tell them about what we're thinking, get feedback so that if there's an opportunity to go forward with these in a collaborative way, we can do so. So to that end, I wanted to briefly kind of touch three concepts that we're looking at. Um, first is the idea of gun violence restraining orders. Uh, and this came out of uh, a really tragic case in California a few years ago where a college student, you may remember him at Santa Cruz, uh, was in a real period of crisis. And uh, parents knew this person was in a period of crisis. They knew that he was unstable. Parents even were calling law enforcement and saying, we're really concerned about this kid. You know, he's our son. We can't get a hold of him. We know he has a weapon. Is there something you can do? And law enforcement said, until a crime has been committed, we don't have a lot of options. And so uh, the California legislature looked at this issue and said, let's create a way for law enforcement or family members to go to a court and say, um, this is an individual who's in a period of crisis right now. Is there some way we can intervene and try and get this person the help they need and just as importantly, remove a firearm so that this doesn't become a, ca a catastrophic moment? And I think that is a common theme I see in a whole lot of shootings um, that occur in our communities. Uh, I, you know, I told you earlier that 75% of gun violence and gun deaths actually involve suicide. But if you think about it, almost all of these mass shootings also are cases of suicide. It's just that person has decided they're going to try and kill a whole bunch of people 
other people before they take their own life. And so we can think of those as, you know, those are an extension of the same people who are in mental crisis who take their own life, is the people who get to the point and say, well, I'm going to take this gun and go to the mall or go to the school and try and kill as many people as I can before I kill myself. You also see this in quote unquote suicide by cop, where an individual decides they're going to get into a confrontation with law enforcement and force that law enforcement individual to shoot them or to try and get into a shootout with that person and take their own life in the process. And, and these are all people who are in periods of crisis. And we know is that if you can get them past that moment of crisis, the chances are they're not going to come back and have it happen again. And even people who attempt to tr commit suicide don't typically try and do that again. So if we can remove the firearm from the situation, temporarily with due process in the courts, that's a way we can avoid these, these tragic shootings and people, and people harming themselves as well as others. Uh, the second piece we're gonna look at is I mentioned a little earlier was child access prevention. And this goes to the idea that if you are a firearm owner, you have a right to own that weapon, but there are also some responsibilities that come with those rights. And those include the idea that the gun should be locked up and so it's not easily accessible, particularly if children are gonna be in the household. A uh, trigger lock is another excellent way to make that gun secure. There are ways to do that that allow for you to still have home protection. You know, I hear a lot of people say, I don't wanna to have to mess with a gun lock or a gun safe. If someone's coming in my house, there are fingerprint gun safes that can be open in seconds if you need to. Um, but there are ways to make sure that someone doesn't gain unintended access because tragically we know from the data that um, there are circumstances where someone needs that gun to defend themselves, but far more often it winds up getting used by a household member to hurt themselves or others or an accidental or an unintended shooting. And we want to minimize that risk by making sure that gun is securely stored. The last uh, piece we're looking at, and this is actually a bill that was introduced this legislative session. Um, we don't know yet because the session's not done until Thursday. It's looking like it may have gotten uh, caught up in the larger politics of the session uh, that I don't know if you all have been following, but it's been pretty intense down there. Um, and this deals with this idea of what's called the Charleston loophole. And that is that even with the background checks legislation we passed in 2015, um, if I go to a gun dealer and that gun dealer runs the background check and the state police say, you know, we just can't find Jake's data, hold on a minute. After three business days, that dealer has discretion to basically give me the gun, even though the background check isn't complete. And we know for some jurisdictions where they have to go pull records, it may take a lot longer to get that correct data back. And unfortunately, we know that when they're denied, uh, or excuse me, delayed, that there's a much higher rate of denial. You know, usually when they had to go pull the records from another state, which is usually the circumstances, there was a good reason to delay that sale. And, uh, and in fact, this tragically happened in the South Carolina shooting with Dylan Roof a few years ago, uh, or excuse me, last fall. Um, this is the individual guy who shot up the church, and it turned out that he tried to purchase a gun. Uh, it should have been prohibited because he had some drug convictions on his record, but they couldn't find those records in, within three days. And so the <coughs> gun dealer transferred the gun to him and that helped contribute to that shooting. So we do know this has an impact um, and that if we can simply say, you know, you're gonna have to wait a little longer before you get your weapon, and so we wanna actually make sure the background check is complete, um, we think that's a really smart way to kind of reduce gun violence. Uh, oh, and I even built out special slides for this. Um, I'll just throw out a couple data points here real quick. Uh, one is with child access prevention, you know, one in three handguns are kept loaded, unlocked, uh, I learned this myself when I had a conversation with my father-in-law about it. I was kind of surprised to learn that he has a loaded weapon he keeps behind the bed, the bed head, uh, you know, just in case he needs it. And that's his prerogative. But um, we have had a conversation about how that's not the situation I'd like to see when we're, our kids are visiting them. And he was very amenable to that. And so I think there are ways to have this conversation. And we estimate, you know, there's 26,000 Oregon children living in a home with unlocked firearms. This is a reality. It's not, um, not the largest form of gun violence, but it's perhaps one of the most tragic and certainly one of the most preventable. I just talked to you about the Charleston loophole, um, so I won't talk about that again. And then the last piece I'll just mention is uh, community engagement. You know, our focus has been on passing laws and policies, and I think that's an important part of the conversation, but I think we also recognize that it's just as important to have a conversation about our culture and, and the norms that go into our society and our values because we can change the laws all we want, but as I mentioned with drunk driving, until we change that approach and how people see this product or see this thing in our community and change their own thinking about how we treat it, that's not really gonna change the conversation. And honestly, I think that will do as much to reduce gun violence as any change in policy. You know, 
just thinking about if you see someone in crisis and you see that they could potentially be a harm to themselves and others, finding some way to check in with them, to have a conversation with them, maybe get them some help to get them beyond that moment. Having a conversation like I did with my father-in-law and saying, hey, you got any guns in the house? Our kids are coming. Have you thought about how you're going to lock them up? Because my kids don't know how to use those guns. Um, there are a lot of ways we can have a conversation. I know um, we're working with a group of gun owners who just want to establish the norm of have that gun locked up, You know, put a trigger lock on that so that it can't have an accidental or an unintended shooting happen in your home. And I think there's a lot of ways we can think about how to have those kind of responsible conversations in our community that don't involve changing any laws at all. Um, I think I'm going to wrap up then. I'll just say you can learn more on our website, which is oralliance.org. You can join the Alliance. We'd love to come speak to community groups. Um, I'm really tired of talking in Portland and Eugene, so anybody outside of those two liberal metropolises, I would love to talk to, because um, that's where the conversation is going to happen. It's not going to be a Portland or a Eugene-based conversation. It really needs to be a statewide conversation. So really appreciate you all having me come out today. Thank you very much, Jake. Appreciate it. As people are lining up for questions, I, it's my job to remind you that if you have failed to purchase your current membership, there's several people here who will be happy to take your funds. And it's only $50 a year. OK, that's the hype. Ladies and gentlemen, also be aware that on April 11th, we will be revisiting this topic. We will have Kevin Starrett from the Oregon uh, Firearms Federation taking perhaps a slightly different uh, take on this. But for right now, we have Jake willing to answer some questions, and we have a lot of people willing to ask them. So please. Great. Go ahead. <laughs> I can't see you. <laughs> Move the umbrella. All right, Mike Mahalik, forum member. Um, I really liked your talk. I'd encourage you to add some t statistics to get a little bit more support. And that is you sort of trivialize gun violence as being um, a major cause of the problem. It is the major cause of the gun violence problem. And uh, while other violence, suicides, accidental shootings, stupid people, whatever, that is a pretty small number, and that uh, is what we all seem to get alarmed about. And uh, perhaps um, looking at some of the other aspects of why there's violence, why there's gun violence, why there's crime, et cetera, I think would add to your argument. So my question is, what are the stats for the people in the room here of how much of the gun violence is due to crime? Great. That's a good question. So just to give you all a little kind of uh, global context about gun violence in Oregon, we have about 400 deaths a year from gun violence. Uh, as I said, about 75% of those are suicide. Um, I don't have a precise figure on gun crime, because uh, that also can be an elastic category, everything from a mass shooting at like Umqua to uh, you know a, a robbery or something like that can get included there. But I believe there's about 50 deaths a year that are attributed to gun crime each year in the state of Oregon. And just to give you a sense of kind of what that statistic means, um, we know that there are more people in Oregon that die each year of gun deaths than die of motor vehicle accidents. And we uh, unfortunately passed that threshold a few years ago. Uh, the good news is I think it has to do with the reducing number of motor vehicle deaths, but um, it still is just kind of gives us some context for that this is a real significant cause of death in our community. Well, yeah leaving out shootings that are, don't re result in uh, death. That's true. And that is a great point as well, is that even if someone doesn't die in that situation, there's an enormous cost that can occur. Um, there was some interesting data that was produced at Oregon Health Science University on kind of the costs of teens and young people coming into the ER with a gunshot wound compared to almost any other health problem. And you just think about the physical recovery, the PT, the emotional cost of that, um, those gunshot victims are far more costly on the system than any kind of other injuries or health things that happen, um, just as well as just kind of the social cost. You know, that's something that someone's going to care with them, carry with them for the rest of their life. Um, really profound experience. So I think that's those are great points as well. Yeah. yeah. Hi, uh, Bill Kroger, forum member. Thank you for coming in today, and I enjoyed your talk. Um, if you happen to know anything about it, I was wondering if you would talk a little bit about Europe 
in regard to gun control. Mm -hmm. I know that they have their problems, you know, the shooting in Scandinavia on that island that killed all those kids and things like that, but it's not mm -hmm. anywhere close to what's going on in the United States. So I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Sure, yeah, and you know, the United States has the unfortunate distinction that we're up there with uh, Venezuela and Colombia and Brazil in terms of kind of per capita gun deaths. And if you know a little something about those countries, those gun deaths are coming for a pretty specific reason, as in there's huge, massive organized crime and civil wars going on. So not exactly the same situation here as the United States. We do by far have the highest uh, rate of gun death of any developed country in the world. Um, I think that happens for a number of reasons. Uh, one is we're one of the only countries in the Western world that has the right to own firearms. You know, if you go to most countries in Europe, gun ownership is very rare. Uh, usually it's regulated. You know, in Germany, you have to register. You actually have to go pass a test to be able to buy a gun in Germany. Um, so there's just a lot of less weapons in those communities. Um, I don't want to pretend that is the only cause, though. Um, the Counterpoint that's usually pointed out is Switzerland. Um, if you all don't know, Switzerland doesn't have a national military. They have kind of a national guard, which is basically every adult who can serve <laughs> is perpetually on call. And one of the associated factors of that is that you actually have your rifle that you have in your home. So gun ownership in Switzerland is very high because that's part of your responsibilities for military service in that country. But you still have a much lower rate of gun death there. Uh, I think there's a lot of factors. Um, we have a very freedom-oriented culture here, and I think that's reflected in kind of how people use and treat firearms, and that goes to kind of that cultural values conversation that we mentioned. Um, we also know that there is a lot less social co cohesion here than in some of other countries, so that we have uh, differences among communities, uh, also have, I think, um, economic disparities and social disparities that lead um, some populations in the United States to seek out weapons. Um, so for instance, if you don't have a lot of confidence that law enforcement's gonna show up in your neighborhood and protect you, uh, you might feel more compelled to own a weapon to protect yourself. So I think there's a lot of factors that go into it. Some are cultural, some have to do with our laws, some have to do with the prevalence of gun ownership, but there's just really no way to, to dispute the fact that we are a enormous outlier when it comes to this problem with almost every other kind of developed or westernized country in the world. Yeah. E. <laughs> Dick Cartwright, forum member. Uh, two sessions ago at the CPO6 meeting uh, held over at the fire department, the mm -hmm. uh, guest speaker uh, was the Washington County Sheriff. What's his name? Pat Garrett, yeah. and I wasn't at that one, but the feedback uh, that came to me was the first thing that he said was, uh, how many concealed permit holders do we have here? And I guess a couple of hands went up, and he said, if you have a concealed permit, carry if you don't get one. And in getting that feedback, I called Darlene Schoner, uh, who represents Washington County Sheriff's mm -hmm. Department at every one of those sessions. I called her and said, why, why did he come in that strong? And she said that uh, in this area, uh, we have nine active gangs at the, at the time, and they've doubled their uh, gang enforcement staff and so forth. And anyway, I've been going to those CPO meetings for quite a while, and the Sheriff's Department hands out uh, these sheets every time of the break-ins, the car thefts, on and on and on, and at this particular, all these dots are, are break-ins and so forth. This is one month. This particular month, it was 139. My point is, if, if you're a victim uh, of, of a house break-in or something like that, it's too late for a cop. Uh, so I thought I'd share that. <laughs> well, I'll just pick that up a little bit without a question on it. Um, and first I should say, I think it is really important to recognize that when individuals have been the victims of violence, that leads a real psychological scar sometimes. And for some folks, having that weapon as, is a measure of personal safety, but also psychological safety, that you're not going to have violence suffered on you again. And so I appreciate why folks feel that need to be safe. 
Um, I will say I think the data speaks for itself that you are far more likely to have that weapon taken away, used against you, used unintentionally, uh, or have a mistaken shooting than actually be able to play Dirty Harry and protect yourself. Um, yeah. I can send some stats along as follow-up to this conversation on that. Um, and the other way I can just give you some context to that is when we look at law enforcement, um, and law enforcement are in active shooter situations where they need to pull their weapon and intervene, uh, the data shows that that law enforcement officer only has a 50 or 60 percent ability to hit, hit the person that they're shooting at. And you can think about what a high stress situation that is when someone's shooting at you, there are civilians around, it's, it's a very high stake situation and that's a trained law enforcement individual. And to put that gun in the hands of a civilian who doesn't have that training I think can frequently lead to a, an unwanted outcome or can lead to um, a truly tragic outcome which we saw almost happen at the Umqua Community Center shooting which is that if you pull out that weapon to intervene into an active shooting situation, law enforcement who arrive on site don't know whether you're the shooter or whether you're there to help. And so you might actually have someone where a good Samaritan is getting accidentally shot in the crossfire by law enforcement that's responding to a very dramatic situation. Um, so that's what I would say. I think that the truth is it's up for each individual to come up with the right balance for them in terms of what they need for personal protection. And what we need to do is establish laws and policies and values in our society that minimizes the impact, the unintended impacts of that. Hi, yeah. I'm Emily Knepp. I'm a member, I'm also a local attorney. And thank you for your work getting higher protections for domestic violence people. My question is, I'm doing a lot of estate planning for folks mm. in my community, and many times grandpa wants to pass his weapons or his weapon collection on to his grandchildren who are minors. Mm. Um, is there a safe way that they can put those in trust with another individual, or they certainly aren't going to be doing background checks on Johnny and mm -hmm. whatnot. Is yeah. there a way to build into an estate plan passing those weapons along efficiently and mm -hmm. legally? Well, I'm not an estate lawyer, but I will, so don't quote me any of this. Um, I think there's a couple things you can look at to do. Um, one is, I know that some people pursue what's called a gun trust, which is actually a legal entity you set up that the guns are transferred to, and then uh, the children or whoever you want to have access to those guns would actually be able to access them through the trust. Now that comes with a significant financial cost because you have to create this whole legal entity to be in possession of the guns. So that may not be a solution for a lot of your clients. Um, you can obviously transfer them to the adults or the parents in that situation under stipulation that a certain age then they will transfer over. Uh, the background checks legislation we passed does have an exception for transfers among family members, including grandparents. So that certainly is allowed under the background check system. Um, so that's, those are a couple ways to deal with it, but I, I agree it is an interesting challenge. Um, and the other thing I'll just clarify there is, you know, let's be careful about not violating the law because uh, handgun ownership for people under, the eight, under age 18 is much more restricted than long gun purchases in Oregon. A minor can own a long gun. I'm less clear on handgun ability. Yeah. Go ahead. John Blackman, former member. Uh, you have mentioned the Second Amendment uh, several times. Mm -hmm. Could you share with us the first four words of the Second Amendment? I believe it's in order to establish a well-regulated militia. The first four words are a well-ordered militia. And the context of that is not individual rights. You might have a cause under the Tenth Amendment, but the Second Amendment is, to my mind, clearly exactly what it says. And furthermore, the historical content of the first Ten Amendments was much more a restraint upon the Congress than individual rights. Thank you. Thank you, and I think that's, um good context to provide. Uh, I've gotten into a few arguments with people on the other side of this issue who tell me what the Constitution means. And I have to say, well, you've got your opinion and I got mine. 
They don't really matter. At the end of the day, the Supreme Court gets to decide that. Um, you know, what I can tell you is the court looked at that question in the 30s after uh, the gun laws that I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation were passed uh, in the Miller decision and held, as you say, that there is no individual right to own weapons. Um, now, that decision was revisited in 2010 uh, by the Supreme Court in the Heller decision, uh, which does say that that amendment means an individual right to bear arms. It was a closely decided 5-4 decision with uh, Antonin Scalia as the deciding vote, so stay tuned. <laughs> Maybe things will change again. Um, but the piece that I will add there is that even um, that raging communist of Antonin Scalia uh, included in his discussion and his uh, court brief that he or the decision that they that he wrote that nothing about whether there is an individual right to own weapons or not should be interpreted as restricting the ability of the government to per enact sensible regulations to prohibit individuals for, w that we agree should not have access to firearms. So things like background checks. Uh, the court also just recently looked at a question of um, storage requirements and decided not to hear that case. So um, the court seems to be coming down that even if we take different perspectives on if there is an individual right versus the right of society to protect itself in the Second Amendment, that we do think that there's a way to do that that allows for a lot of sensible gun laws to be enacted. So. Chris Leslie, former member. I was reading in the Oregon gun laws on the internet a lot of infor interesting information. It already had a law that required any private parties to go through a gun dealer to verify that. When did you pass that law? Uh, that was in 2015. Okay. Yeah. So it's there. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. And we have open carry throughout most of the state except for Loma, Portland, Beaverton, and Taggart. S so you're absolutely correct. There is a strong preemption in state law that greatly regulates what a local jurisdiction can do. Uh, one of the exceptions to that um, relates to open carry uh, and whether you can pass a amendment or a local ordinance that would basically prohibit people from openly carrying weapons in that jurisdiction. But I will add, uh, the concealed handgun license provisions I talked about earlier supersede that. So uh, Portland actually does have that regulation. Um, you all have may have seen this in 2013 and 2014. We had a couple of gun rights activists who decided they would take their assault rivals to Selwood and walk up and down in front of the elementary school there. As you can imagine, this created some kerfuffle. Um, and law <laughs> enforcement was called, and they had a healthful conversation about this, the laws in, in Oregon, and those individuals were correct, that because they had concealed handgun licenses, they were entitled to openly carry an assault rifle uh, outside of a school in Portland. So those, those rules do exist as a local thing, but um, under state law right now, certain individuals are exempt from them. My mm -hmm. real question is, yes. isn't this really an emotional subject that uh, is carried out with a lot of hype and emotion and not really based on what uh, George Washington was protected by every man was in the militia in those revolutionary days. So that's where the uh, militia came from, that mm -hmm. idea in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. I think that's right, and I think how the guns that are available in our society have changed dramatically from that time. The, the idea that one individual would be able to have the firepower to go into a sh uh, movie theater and shoot dozens and dozens of people was something that they never envisioned, right? Because that wasn't a technology that was available. And so as the technology evolves, as we see people are able to do new things, you know, at least my position is that our laws and our values need to evolve to reflect that. Um, in terms of, I think, your question of efficacy of gun laws in general, um, I will say I wish there was more data. Um, I think the, the studies that I've looked at 
support these policies, but I think that everyone agree we need to research these more. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the gun manufacturing lobby uh, was able to push, push stuff through Congress about a decade ago that prohibited any federal money from going to studies of gun violence. And so that's really restricted the ability of the National Institute of Health and some of the other academic institutions we have to really fund good data. And so uh, what I would hope is that everyone on this issue could get behind doing that research. Because if, as some suggest, these laws aren't effective, let's find that out and see what does work. Um, so that would be my hope, is that we can actually delve a little more into the data and understand um, what's the most effective way to, to address this. Hi, Jake. Rob Solomon, forum member. Thanks again, Jake, for your talk and answering these questions. When you were talking, you mentioned something about a fingerprint lock for gun containers. Mm -hmm. One of the more emotional things when you listen to all of these aftermaths of the shooting is when the president is talking and he's talking about how we have to do something. I remember hearing him say something which I thought was brilliant and it's technological, not emotional. I'm wondering if you know anything about the possibility of just like my fingerprint opens my phone, can we have a trigger on a gun that's sensitive like that? Yep, they're, uh, they're calling them smart guns. Um, and they are a new product that started to come online in the last year or two. Uh, I think that they would be a really interesting thing for us to explore, and one of the conversations I've had with Alliance members is maybe starting with our law enforcement members, um, assuming that they're okay with this, uh, because one of the things you'll hear from members of law enforcement is that they're most scared of getting in an altercation with someone and having that weapon taken away from them and used against them. And actually, I think you'll hear this, you know, in kind of the Black Lives Matter context of traffic stops and kind of the anxiety that creates among law enforcement because you are in a contentious situation. And so uh, if there was interest uh, on the part of law enforcement, I think that might be an interesting solution is to start with them to have these type of weapons so that there's no way someone could take that away and use it against them. Um, I will say, some folks have suggested these. Uh, there was one major gun rights blogger who came out in support of this and was pilloried uh, by the activists on that side of how dare you do this. And so I think there's also been some reticence on the part of industry to bring these up because they worry that they're gonna face reprisals within the gun community. And that's really unfortunate because you'd want, I would hope that those individuals would see this as an alternative to better regulation. You know, that by individual behavior, you can make the community safer and uh, eliminate the need for government regulation. I, I will say that there's one other thing that I wanted to mention, and I don't have a lot of answers here, but I just think it's interesting kind of how technology is evolving, is um, have you all heard of these things called 3D scan uh, printers? New technology where you can literally print anything. And some individuals have correctly figured out you could print a gun, uh, which raises a very interesting question because every gun in the United States has to have a serial number that tracks it. Well, if you can print something out of your printer, it doesn't have a serial number. And uh, I will say I started that conversation out of kind of concern of, wow, here's a whole new source of unregulated weapons that can be out there in the public. Uh, in addition to the 300 million we've already got in the United States. But um, you know, once I get beyond that, it does force me to acknowledge that this conversation is going to have to change, you know, that we can't just rely on point of sale as the only way to regulate guns because this technology is going to get more and more common. Um, you even have some activists here in state who have made a point of that you can go to Home Depot and with about 50 bucks you can make your own shotgun um, and you know, you don't need to you can just build it out of the parts you find at Home Depot. So I think this is going to be part of the conversation and why it's really important for us to have this cultural conversation and not just focus on rules and laws, but actually the values in which we um, behave when it comes to guns. Yeah. Hi, uh, Phil Nelson, forum member. Mm -hmm. Appreciate yeah. your talk. Of course. It's another kind of mechanical or weapons mm -hmm. uh, question. I hear the term assault weapon, and I'm wondering if you could describe what an assault weapon is uh, uh, versus other kinds of weapons. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'd have a little, maybe a little context for, uh, for that Absolutely. definition. And, and I will say this is a tricky conversation and I wanna uh, acknowledge that from the start. I think um, the idea of assault weapons or the idea of weapons that are largely for war fighting purposes. So modifications of the rifles or semi or fully automatic weapons that we give to our warfighters, our, our soldiers, uh, to protect ourselves. And so um, that's, I think, the connotation of that. But 
um, as your comment kind of suggests, the details, the devil's in the details when it comes to that. So for instance, um, the assault weapons ban that was passed in the 90s in the United States said, these are the 20 guns that we consider assault rifles, and these are now prohibited for sale in the United States. And dealers very, or manufacturers said, okay, well, if we lengthen the stock or if we change this or we change the grip, suddenly we're no longer covered under these guns. And so um, I think there is a, a very important value statement about why do we have these weapons that are largely used for war and why would you need to end own those as an individual, and you actually hear a lot of veterans saying that. Um, you know, I think General McChrystal said that uh, not a few years ago of why would a, a citizen need that for a personal protection or hunting or something like that. And I think that's a legitimate question. Now, how you would actually regulate and eliminate the sale of assault weapons is a much more tricky thing because it does come down to all these technicals about you know the stock and the length of the barrel and all these things that you know once you set the rules, a smart capitalist is like. Let's just go right around that. So I don't know if that's an answer to your question, but I think that is kind of the, the discussion we're having right now. Yeah. OK, I'm, I'm curious about how you would uh, handle in this day, at uh, this time frame, a situation in which I was a Cub Scout leader. Mm -hmm. And um, the fa uh, fa there was a family with three brothers. Mm -hmm. And they moved to another area. Mm -hmm. And the Cub Scout and the younger brother ended up playing with the, a neighbor. Mm -hmm. And in the process, they got into a gun cabinet that was unlocked mm -hmm. with, with a gun. And the uh, Cub Scout ended up getting killed. Oh, yeah. So how, OK, in this day and age, and I, I don't remember since nobody knew you know, who, who, who'd, who'd done what, except leaving the cabinet uncovered. Right. How would you deal with that kind of a situation now? Mm -hmm. So there's a couple ways um, to deal with that. And you know, again, I'll say I don't expect that this will eliminate every kind of tragedy. I think those will still happen even when we take our best efforts. But I think we can make them a lot less frequent. And so a couple things. One is um, just the value of when you're going to send your kid to somebody, stay with someone else or to another house, ask. Have that conversation with them. And that, was, like I said, was really kind of a radical revelation to me that I need to talk to my friends that, you know, I've never really had a conversation about gun ownership. I don't know, you know, but I know that 30 to 40 percent of households in Portland do have guns. And so probably incumbent on me to make, make sure and have that conversation with them. And so I think that's one step we can do to force people to think proactively, oh, yeah, my gun isn't safely secured and my kids, I am going to have kids over at my house. And we actually, you know, would like to create that obligation under law to think about that. Um, I think the other piece is trying, and, and, that can also, and that can include things like gun locks, um, gun safes, keeping the weapon unlocked, um, disassembled. There's a variety of different ways to kind of make sure someone can't just pick up that weapon and harm themselves. And then, I mean, I think there is an incumbent rule for us to try and educate children about this. Uh, I think that's also only a partial solution. We know, or at least I know from my kids, that if I tell them no, that's like, <laughs> let's do it. Um, but I think trying to have that conversation with them, saying this is not a toy, this is not something to play with. Uh, if you find a gun like this, you know, please alert an adult right away. This is something to not be touched in any way. I think that's an important kind of expectation we need to put on children as well. But each of these are partial. And I don't think there's going to be a magic solution. But this is kind of that balancing act, just like you know, anyone who's had teenagers, so I hear, you know, you can do everything you can to make sure that liquor is locked away, but you can't guarantee that Friday night when you're out of town, the kids aren't going to find some way to bust open that lock and, and, and drink that alcohol. But that doesn't mean that we don't lock it up, right? We do what we can. We try and minimize the harm. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, I'm Spencer. And um, going back to your earlier the earlier question about the assault weapons. Mm -hmm. I think you identified an important, you made an important distinction about how the gun manufacturers adapted their, their processes to re in reaction to the, to the restriction on assault weapons. Um, it's really no longer a matter of individual rights um, or some lofty uh, constitutional point that's being made, it's really about the capital marketplace mm -hmm. and how the gun manufacturers have 
taken this argument in order to, uh, you know, cre you know c create greater business for themselves. Um, how do you argue then, um, as someone who advocates for safety, against the other side, mm -hmm. whose messaging is being perpetrated by, uh, by capitalists who are only interested in, in, the, in, 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 in greater profits? Yeah. Well, and I think that's a really interesting evolution. Um, you know, everyone's probably heard of the NRA, right? Um, NRA's changed a lot. You know, it was started as kind of a grassroots organization. It was focused on people who liked to shoot or hunt in their community. And that was really kind of its target, was much more kind of recreational outdoor uh, enthusiasts who, you know, would use it to go hunting or target shooting or things like that. Um, as our countries become more urbanized, um, people do go out and hunt less. They go out and sport shoot less. Uh, industry needed to find a way to keep making money. And so you've seen a very strong shift towards the idea of collecting guns and buying guns for guns sake. Not that you're going to buy a gun that allow you to hunt, but you're going to buy a collector's item and then go show it off to your friends and buy all of the uh, accoutrement for that gun, you know, the fancy stock and the night scope and all these other kind of uh, bling that looks lovely on your gun. And so there's been a shift pushed by the gun manufacturers to make money, uh, really to move towards this idea of don't, you know, you don't need your one gun to go out and hunt. You need 10 guns and 12 guns and 20 guns so that you can go to the swap and show your friends all your awesome guns. And, and that's also shifted the way that the NRA has approached this issue. You know, the NRA used to be a much more kind of middle of the road citizen-led organization, but as more and more money for the NRA has flowed directly from the gun manufacturers, you've seen them progressively taking a harder and harder and harder line on these issues because, after all, they recognize who's paying their checks now and who they need to represent. And so that's led to a real kind of coarsening of the position of the NRA. What we need to do as a community, like we do on any other conversation, is say, this needs to be a policy set for the citizens of this community for what's right for us. It shouldn't be driven by any special interest, rich or powerful, regardless of the issue. We need to be able to have a community conversation. And that's one of the parts that I'm really most excited about for the Alliance for Gun Safety is we're going out and having conversations with gun owners, with veterans, with law enforcement, people that have not necessarily been at the forefront of fighting on these issues to say, are there ways that we can have a conversation with you and find common ground? Because I think that's where we need to go to move beyond these kind of polarized opposites and to reduce the power of the NRA and some of the other organizations that are very vocal on these issues is by saying, you don't represent most of us. You don't represent the majority of our community and we're able to come together and have a common ground conversation about sensible gun laws in a way that isn't just being driven by how much money that these uh, businesses can make. Because unfortunately, that's the dynamic we're faced with today. Yeah. Okay. Thank you yeah. very, very much. Wonderful presentation. Really responsive to the questioners. Thank you very, very much, Jake, and the Alliance of Gun Control. Folks, um, next week, same time, same station, we will have a look at the corporate tax measure. Ben Unger from Our Oregon will be here and a representative from Defeat the, just a minute, I want to get the title right, the Defeat the Tax on Oregon Sales. It's not Defeat Oregon Sales Tax. There's a group that's been formed called Defeat the Tax on Oregon Sales. And this organization has 60 years, for those of you that don't know, this is our 60th birthday. My gosh, I'm just a little older than the organization. Anyway, in 60 years, we are committed to trying to present two sides to every issue. And we will be doing that next week as far as the tax measure is concerned. And one more time, it's going to be uh, April 11th that the Oregon Firearms Federation, represented by Kevin Starrett, will also be here for further conversation about this terribly important issue. Ladies and gentlemen, as we bring the forum to a close today, thank you so much and we'll see you next week.